Hello everyone. Today what I'd like to do is think about if we have this system of a pulley and a rope and a mass connected up at either end of that rope and we actually consider the effect of the mass of the rope itself, what happens? How does that change our solution? So usually in this kind of problem we ignore the mass of the rope. And we are going to make some assumptions. So this time we are going to pretend there's no friction between the rope and the pulley, right? So it's just sliding perfectly smoothly over the top. We're also going to assume that the string itself is inextensible. Okay, so the length of the string doesn't, or the length of the rope doesn't change. And we are saying the rope has a mass per unit length of lambda, and the total length of the rope is L. So that's the length from this mass M1 up to here, and then all the way around the pulley, and then all the way down to M2. That is fixed at L. Okay, and so we start these two masses at an equal height um, and we release them from rest. We want to know what happens, how do the masses move? So our approach is going to be slightly different as well from what I've done in the last couple of videos. I've been talking about this in terms of forces before. This time I'm going to think about it in terms of energy because it just works out slightly, slightly easier, slightly more manageable that way. It is possible to do this using forces and considering small elements of the rope, which is interesting. Um, but it's kind of time consuming and a bit more involved, so maybe that's something for um, for another video. Anyway, so let's make a start and think about what we know about the energy of this system. In order to write down an expression for the energy, the first thing I want to do is define, um, define a very important parameter, which is basically how much the masses have moved. So let's say M2 is heavier than M1, then M2 2 is going to move downwards, right, while M2, sorry, while M1 has to move upwards by the same amount because we're assuming the string is inextensible. So after some time, let's say T, M2 will have moved down by an amount um, X of T. Okay, so that's what's going to happen after, after some amount of time. And then M1 must have moved up by the corresponding amount uh, over here, right? So this distance is also X of T. Okay, so basically what we're doing is solving for x of t because that tells us how the masses um, are moving. So let's write down an expression for the kinetic energy of this system, Ek. So kinetic energy is a half times the mass times the speed squared. So what we get is we can immediately write down half, um, where we get an m1v squared term plus an m2v squared term. So we can just immediately factorize that m1 plus m2 um, and the speed, remember, is just the time derivative of the position, which is x. And so if we denote a time derivative with a dot, we can write that nice and concisely as x dot squared. Okay, but remember the rope itself also has a mass, so therefore the rope itself has some kinetic energy. What is that going to be equal to? Um, well, this is actually easier than you might think because Remember that the rope is inextensible, right? Which means every single element within that rope is moving with the same speed. And because the masses are moving with speed x dot, then every element of the rope is also instantaneously moving with a linear speed of x dot. So the kinetic energy of the rope is just a half times the total mass of the rope, which is lambda l, right? Because it has a length l and a mass per unit length lambda. Uh, and then we also just get this x dot squared. So there you go, that's the kinetic energy. What about the potential energy? Well, this is going to be purely gravitational because the string isn't stretching, so there's no elastic potential energy. Um, what I'm going to do is start off by writing that it is EP0, where EP0 is the potential energy of the system in its initial configuration. Okay, now this, it's, it just makes it slightly easier to deal with this if we write the potential energy in terms of this initial energy. We don't really care about the value of this for reasons that will become clear um, shortly, basically because we can end up differentiating this and this constant term will disappear. All right, so if we start with the potential energy EP0, what's happening is M1 is moving up a distance of x, so it's gaining a gravitational potential energy of m1gx. Similarly, m2 is moving down by an amount of x, so m2 is losing gravitational, poten uh, gravitational potential energy m2gx. What about the change in potential energy of the rope itself? Well, a kind of neat way of thinking of this is think about this little segment of rope here. Okay, now this bit of rope has a center of mass 
at this cross, which is at a distance x over 2 upwards, right? Because it's a, uh, we're assuming the mass is uniformly distributed along the rope. Okay, what we've done in going from our initial, condition, uh, initial configuration to our final configuration is basically taken this little segment of rope and put it down here, like appended it onto the end of the other side of the rope. Of course, that's not what's actually happened, but from the point of view of gravitational potential energies, it's entirely equivalent. So we can imagine we've taken this bit of rope and we've moved it down here so that its center of mass is x over 2 below m2. So the net effect of that is that um, the rope has lost some gravitational potential energy, right? The amount it's lost is, well, the mass of the little bit of rope that we've moved, which is lambda x, okay? And we've moved the center of mass from x over 2 above m1 to x over 2 below m2. And so the center of mass has moved a total distance of x, okay? So the gv that it's lost is going to be lambda x times g times x, okay? So um, what are we going to do next? Well, consider the total energy. I'm going to write as E tot for total energy, and use the fact that there is no there are no dissipative forces, right? There's no friction here. So if we differentiate the total energy with respect to time, so E total dot, that has to be equal to zero. Okay, so um, let's do that. Let's differentiate a total energy, which is EK plus EP. If we differentiate EK, when we differentiate X dot, we pull down a factor of two, Right, so this, the, the halves in both of these terms um, are going to just disappear. Um, so let's, let's make a start. We can write down m1 plus m2. Then we decrease the power by 1, so we get x dot, but then we have to use the chain rule because remember we're differentiating with respect to time. So we multiply this whole thing by the time derivative of x dot, which is x uh, double dot. Right, and then we do the same thing for the second term, so we get lambda l x dot um, x double dot. So that's the time derivative of the kinetic energy. How about the potential energy? Well, when we differentiate this first term, this constant term, we get zero, okay? So that works out nicely. Then, um, what are we going to get? Uh, well, when we differentiate x with respect to time, we just get x dot, so we can write down m1 minus m2 gx dot, right, from differentiating these two terms here. And finally, this last term is in x squared, right, because we've got an x times an x. So when we differentiate that, we will get minus 2 lambda g x. But again, from the chain rule, we have to multiply by x dot because we're differentiating with respect to time. So that whole thing has to be equal to 0. Now, if we want to know x as a function of time, we've got to just solve this thing, right? You can identify two different cases. One is x dot is identically equal to 0, and then every single term is going to disappear, right? Because there's a common factor of x dot. So that is a solution, but it's not really an interesting solution because it just means the masses are just kind of sitting around, not moving, not doing anything. So we don't really care about that case. Um, so let's say, well, if x dot is not zero, then you can divide through by that um, and obtain the following equation, m1 plus m2 plus lambda l x double dot um, minus 2 or yeah, let's do it this way, minus 2 um, lambda g x, and then I'm also going to take this constant term, when we different, when we divide by the x dot, we just get a constant, I'm going to take that over to the other side and change the sign, so that's going to be m2 minus m1 g. Okay, so this is what we call our equation of motion for x. It's a differential equation that tells us how x varies in time, and we've just got to solve this. Now, the way to do this is first find what we call the complementary function, then find what we call the particular integral. And the complementary function is basically what we get when we pretend the right-hand side is zero. So let's do that first. And the standard way to do that is just try a sensible solution. And because we're looking for a function such that when you differentiate it twice with respect to time and then subtract some multiple of itself, you get to zero, the only kind of well, not the only kind, but uh, one kind of function that satisfies that is an exponential, right? Hyperbolic uh, trig functions would also work, but they're 
um, not linearly independent from exponentials. So let's try a solution of the form. Um, x is proportional to e to some constant times time. And just plug that in to our uh, equation of motion and see what happens. And remembering, for now, we're imagining that the right-hand side is 0. So if we do that, well, when we differentiate this twice with respect to time, we just pull down a factor of k squared, because when you differentiate each time, you get a factor of k. Um, that's how differentiating exponentials works. So we'll get a k squared, uh, e to the kt, and then minus 2 lambda g, and then this is just x itself, so e to the kt, that's 0. So e to the kt is never going to be 0, so we can divide by that and say that um, k, well, there's two values, right, because we've got k squared. So k, I'm going to call them pl k plus and k minus, or k plus or minus for short, is going to be plus or minus the square root of 2 lambda g over m1 plus m2 plus lambda l. Okay, what does that mean? Our complementary function for x, which I'm going to denote as xc, is going to be some constant a times e to the k plus t plus some other constant b times e to the k minus t. Okay, so there you go. There's the complementary function for x. So we've got our complementary function for x. The next thing to do is find the particular integral for x, which is basically how we take account of the fact that the right-hand side of this differential equation is not actually zero. And the way to do it is basically by making an educated guess. And we say, well, the right-hand side is a constant, so let's guess that x itself just has some constant term. And so um, let's try a solution. So let's just try a solution of the form x is some constant c. Plug that in to our uh, equation. Uh, differential equation and we get minus 2 lambda g c is equal to m2 minus m1 g. In other words c itself is just going to be minus m2 minus m1 over 2 lambda. Okay uh, so that worked and so we can say our general solution, uh, so the most general solution for x is going to be the sum of this constant, the particular integral uh, with this complementary function. So x of t is going to be a e to the k plus t plus b e to the k minus t and then plus this constant or minus m2 minus m1 over 2 lambda. Okay, the next thing or the last thing to do actually is apply some initial conditions to find the actual values of a and b. So let's say, um, you know, we're starting this system from uh, from kind of an well not an equilibrium but we're starting them from the from the same height right in other words x is zero initially when t is zero so if x when t is zero is zero we can just plug in these values to our x of t in general when t is zero e to the zero is one right and so we get a plus b um, minus m two minus m one over two lambda is zero um, or in other words a plus b is equal to this. Okay, so our other initial condition is going to be that we release the system from rest. So x dot, the speed at time zero is also zero. So when we differentiate x, when we differentiate the first time we pull down a factor of k plus, so we get k plus a. When we differentiate the second time we pull down a factor of k minus, so we get k minus b. And then we differentiate the constant, it disappears. So this has to be zero. Okay, now, Remember that k plus and k minus are actually defined up here, right? Notice that k minus is just minus k plus. They only differ by a sign because of this plus or minus sign um, in the front. So we can write, but k minus is minus k plus. So the second equation becomes k plus a minus b um, is zero. In other words, a has to equal b because k plus itself is not zero, okay, from this definition up here. So finally, a is b, right? So if we go back to this first condition, if a equals b, then we can write this left-hand side is just 2a, or equivalently 2b. Um, so therefore, uh, we can say a equals b, which is equal to just this right-hand side here, divided by 2. So 
uh, well, let's write it as half m2 minus um, m1 over 2 lambda. And so going back to our general uh, form of x, we can plug in our a and b and do a bit of factorization to find that x of t is, let's put out a common factor of m2 minus m1 over 2 lambda. Then, um, so our a is going to be half of that, right? And then we also get our exponential term, remembering the definition of k, uh, or k plus, it was um, 2 lambda g over m1 plus m2 plus lambda l. Okay, that whole thing um, multiplied by time. And then our b term is a half e to the, um, well, the same thing, but with a minus sign. So in fact, maybe what I can do is just copy that whole thing, put it here, and then put a minus sign in front of that. Okay, and then we've got our constant, which is this minus um, m2 minus m1 over 2 lambda. Because we've pulled out this common factor, we just subtract 1 here. And there we go, there is our general solution um, for x. Now, if you prefer, you can write this in terms of the hyperbolic um, cosine. But yeah, either way, either way is fine. So what do we notice about this? Well, basically you've got two terms that vary with time. The second term kind of decays with time, and the first one grows with time. So the long-term motion is going to be basically an exponential growth of x. So why actually is that? Well, it kind of makes physical sense, right? Because if you think about what happens when m2 moves downwards, what is happening is that the pull is getting stronger. Because the rope itself has mass, the further down m2 goes, the greater the imbalance of mass gets because you're taking mass from the left and putting it onto the right, which is exactly like what exponential growth is, right? It's when the rate of change of something is proportional to itself. So the more, the further down m2 goes, the stronger the pull is, and therefore it's going to just keep accelerating like that. So exponential growth is kind of what we'd expect on physical grounds. So there you go. Hope this has been useful and interesting, and uh, see you again soon.